Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, as you said, I'm going to talk about membranes and droplets. The membranes you already see here, but I'm going to introduce them with another slide. These are giant vesicles that I'm going to introduce. And we start with a textbook picture of the cell. If you throw out all the organelles uh, out of the cell and then you also remove the proteins, what you're going to end up with is a giant vesicle. These giants are relatively small, but they are gigantic compared to conventional vesicles with 100 nanometers in size. And they're uh, a nice mimetic system, which represents the response of the membrane at the cell size scale. And they're also a very nice biomimetic compartment because you can now start reconstituting individual um, proteins and uh, you can reconstitute some cytoskeletal elements. And in this way, you can start building up uh, cellular functionality, uh, adding component by component. And this will be like a bottom-up approach for uh, building what you want to do. Or you can also uh, use the top-down approach where you force the cell to make your giant vesicle. It's also called a bleb or a giant plasma membrane vesicle where all the plasma membrane proteins are prote properly reconstituted, oriented, and you have all the whole zoo of uh, lipids. You might be surprised to know that the mechanical properties of such giant plasma membrane vesicles are very similar to the... Uh, uh, mechanical properties of uh, single or two component lipid uh, vesicles, which is started in this uh, studies, which is to say that the underlying me mechanics is set by the lipid bilayer. Some, uh, you can use the, these giant vesicles to measure properties, and this slide would uh, review this um, very briefly. Uh, you can measure the stretching elasticity by aspirating giant vesicles in micropipettes, and you're going to get a number which is close to the stretching elasticity of a rubber um, sheet with the same thickness of five nanometers. Um, the bending rigidity is measured in units of energy, 20 kBT is very small, uh, which is to say that if several water molecules hit the membrane simultaneously, it would exhibit thermal noise, like uh, shown here in this movie of the dancing vesicle. The shear surface viscosity you can um, measure by sticking a bead, or, uh, manipulated with an optical tweezer, and then steering it along the membrane. And the number that you are going to get if you convert it into bulk viscosity uh, would be uh, around 1,000 times the viscosity of uh, water. But still, movement of uh, lipid species on the membrane is uh, easy, simply because the membrane is thin and dissipation occurs into the environment. If you have such a setup, you can also pull uh, tubes of very high curvature, cylindrical tubes from the, the membrane. And you can look at um, uh, curvature preference of different proteins, for example, between the flat membrane and the highly curved one. And finally, if you stretch the membrane too much, you can create pores. And we look at the closure of such pores, which uh, we induce with uh, electroporation to measure the edge tension uh, of uh, the membrane. So if you got interested in uh, all of this, here is a book for you a giant book about giant uh, vesicles, which uh, is a kind of a textbook like material, which um, introduces various protocols and approaches um, um, about using membranes, uh, giant vesicles to learn more about membranes. Um, there are many labs that use giant vesicles and uh, people typically look for the ideal or clean vesicle, but very often one observes tubes and buds and the tubes can be inward or outward. They can be very thin or they can be pearl chain like, and they mean something. They mean that the membrane prefers to take to, or adopt a certain curvature, which is called spontaneous curvature. It uh, describes the bilayer asymmetry, which can be result, as a result of a different composition of the two leaflets or different um, a composition of the solutions across the membrane. A symmetric ion or protein absorption. The nomenclature is such that the membrane bends outward and then the, the curvature is uh, positive, or if it's negative, it's uh, the membrane bends inward. And this is one example of small positive curvature. So the, the bud here that is um, uh, produced is uh, large, so this is small curvature. It's outward, that's why it's positive, and here it's negative, high negative curvature. The message here is that giant, just looking at these giant vesicles morphology, uh, you have a kind of a, a direct and fine sensor for membrane uh, asymmetry. 
And uh, now I'm going to give very briefly two examples of uh, such uh, tubes and asymmetries. The first one is GM1, a sugar-like lipid, uh, which is predominantly um, situated at the outer leaflet of the neuronal membranes. And this was work initiated by Nico Frick and Tripta Bakia, who com uh, composed, uh, prepared vesicles that had more GM1 inside, which generated negative spontaneous curvature in a lot of tubes. These tubes are connected to the vesicle uh, body because, and we know that because if you start aspirating these vesicles, the tubes are reabsorbed to the uh, surface. And if you release the tension, they would um, uh, reform. Um, and uh, we also see that up to 50% of the vesicle area can be stored in such tubes, which is to say that um, cells can also use a similar mechanism of storing area that is needed afterwards for protrusion. And this area can be stored in such uh, tubes simply, rather than fusing vesicles and producing excess area for protrusions. Now, to measure the spontaneous curvature, and this is work initiated by Arachtin Gusgupta, you can measure the force with an optical tweezer, which is needed to pull a tube. This force is proportional to the tension of the membrane, which you set with the pipette, and you can measure with this aspiration pipette. Kappa is the bending rigidity, and then you have a term which reflects the spontaneous curvature M. Now, if you take a membrane which is purely symmetric, just made out of one lipid called POPC, you look at the black data, the slope would give you the bending rigidity and the intercept would give you the spontaneous curvature. This is a symmetric membrane, so the spontaneous curvature is zero and the slope is zero. If you start doping the membrane asymmetrically with this molecule, you start getting some non-zero intercept and you can get what is the spontaneous curvature um, uh, out of this intercept, which is of the order of uh, one over 100 to, to uh, one over 200 nanometers. Now, we were then wondering, okay, so asymmetric um, absorption of um, molecules can uh, drive uh, curvature. How about ions? And this is motivated by the asymmetry across the plasma membrane. Outside, you have a lot of sodium and chlorine ions. Inside, you have potassium ions, but no chlorine ions, and the electron neutrality is balanced with macromolecules. So we try to develop two systems that mimic this kind of asymmetry, and this was work initiated by Marzi Karimi. So in the first system, we have low asymmetry, just a little bit of sugar and uh, a little bit of salt outside, both isotonic, like uh, osmotically balanced. We, so and compare this to a highly asymmetric system where you have a lot of sucrose inside and uh, osmotically balanced uh, salt outside. So Margie did the same experiment, measured the force as a function of tension and looked at the intercept. And for the low asymmetry system, the intercept was uh, negligible, uh, reflecting negligible spontaneous curvature. While here, just by this asymmetry of salt and sugar, you get this um, um, highly high negative spontaneous curvature, which is why when we deflate these vesicles, they produce these tubes. And because the spontaneous curvature is inversely proportional to the tube radius, we know that these tubes have a diameter of one over 100, one over 120. Now, um, so there are various asymmetries that can cause uh, um, shapes in the membranes. And we were wondering about the crowded uh, cytoplasm. Here's uh, a movie illustrating how crowded this environment is. So you have a lot of macromolecules. And uh, if you think about that, uh, the, the Gibbs phase rule would tell you that uh, in such a crowded environment, you should have different phases. And uh, this is the one illustration of this uh, in the cell for P granules. So these are droplets or phases, liquid liquid phase separation. And uh, some of you might be aware that this is now a big hype uh, among the uh, biologist community talking about um, liquid liquid phase separation, biomolecular condensates or protein rich uh, droplets, um, all of this. If you look into the literature already in the 80s, uh, this has been known. Now we are rediscovering the wheel more or less. But if you look at such electron microscopy uh, data, you are going to see that these protein bodies called before uh, are actually droplets because they are smoothly curved and they can deform the membrane. So this is what we were wondering. If you have so many droplets and you have so many membrane structures inside the cell, what happens when the droplet means the membrane? And uh, to study this, and this is work that we initiated already uh, quite some time ago, almost 15 years ago, uh, with Yonghang Li and uh, Yonghang Liu, 
we mimic the crowded environment in the cell by encapsulating in our kind of artificial cells, we encapsulated macromolecules like PEG and dextran. Polyethylene glycol and dextran are simple molecules, well known. They are water soluble. If you mix them, you are going to get an aqua solution. But if you increase the, the concentration of, uh, of uh, PEG and dextran, you're going to end up uh, with phase separation in your test tube where you have uh, uh, two aqueous phases. The dextran rich one is heavy and it's at the bottom, and the PEG rich phase is. Uh, at the top. So we wanted to have this phase separation inside the vesicles by crossing this uh, binodal. And you can do that by exposing the vesicles to hyper, um, high osmolarity solution. The membrane is permeable to water, so water leaks out and the, the polymer gets concentrated. And there you go, you have phase separation inside. This is a vertical cross section of, uh, of the vesicles. And here is a phase contrast of the process, which is uh, sped up. It takes about two hours. Here you see the uh, condensation of the dextran-rich phase. And the faint contour of the membrane is here, if you see my pointer. Now, um, in these conditions, the dextran-rich droplet does not want to be in contact with the membrane. But if you go further, ta-da, there is a wetting transition. Uh, now the, the, the dextran-rich droplet partially wets the, uh, the membrane. There is an exclamation mark here, even though wetting transitions have been known for ages about droplets on solid substrate. The interesting thing here is that the membrane is not a solid substrate. It's a very soft um, uh, substrate. And you can imagine that if the interfacial tension here is very high, it should be able to deform the membrane. And this is what we see here. With further deflation, um, the dextran-rich phase here starts protruding out. The membrane goes around to enwrap both of them, which we see also with confocal microscopy. And further deflation can even lead to separating the, the vesicle into two compartments with two different uh, solutions. If the phase separation uh, occurs outside, you can end up with droplets weighting the, the vesicles and having such moon-like shapes. Um, uh, moon-like shape uh, vesicles. And if you have um, enough uh, area, you can, uh, oops, uh, you can even have uh, engulfment uh, like or endocytic like uh, processes where the vesicle wraps the whole um, uh, droplet. Um, when you have too much membrane, it, is get, it gets stored into tubes uh, at, that accumulate at the interface. And here is also a vertical cross section of a vesicle with the dextran rich droplet and the peg rich one here, and the tubes accumulate in here. If you look from above, you're going to see this spaghetti like structure of membrane nanotubes absorbed at the interface simply to minimize the interfacial um, energy. The tubes are stabilized um, or, and, uh, by spontaneous curvature generated by the weak absorption of uh, PEG on the membrane, which you know from simulations that uh, use exactly the membrane composition that uh, we have. Um, when the um, interface gets very crowded, we see that we don't see any more much with confocal images, uh, but uh, work initiated by Tsiliang Cao using STED microscopy, super resolution microscopy, uh, we could resolve these uh, nanotubes at the interface. What Tsiliang also observed is that uh, at the right interfacial tension and excess uh, area, these tubes that are at the interface can start transforming into double membrane sheets. So just watch the end of this tube which uh, transforms into something that looks like a balloon. Uh, this is actually a very flat balloon, or we call it a double membrane sheet or double membrane, uh, very flat pancake like looking like um, a vesicle, which is reminiscent to the um, organelle uh, shapes of the cisterna like structures of the um, endoplasmic uh, reticulum. Here are more images of this, and this is just a, a, a projection in the vertical direction just to tell, show you that these double membrane sheets are very thin. Now, okay, you can say, fine, Peg and Dexon can do all this, so what? What is the relevance to biological crowding in systems? So coming back to this uh, slide, uh, again, these are protein-rich droplets, and uh, we also looked at protein-rich droplets, and this was work initiated by Nana Chen, who used soy glycine. This is a major storage protein in the vacuole of plant cells, of soybean seeds, 
and now looked at uh, what happens uh, of, uh, to glycine in solutions uh, when you change salt, pH, temperature, and she could uh, kind of uh, resolve the phase diagram of uh, this system, finding the region in the phase diagram where condensates form or droplets form, protein-rich droplets. And uh, then Agustin Mangiarotti in the group brought these condensates in the vicinity of giant vesicles and look at how they interact. At low salt concentration, they don't seem to like each other, but if you increase the salt or you, if you can also play with the membrane charge, you can modulate that and go from complete de-weighting to partial weighting and to even complete weighting when the, when the droplets want to fully spread on the surface. The stickiness is characterized, uh, you can think of a contact angle, uh, but this is true only if you have a flat uh, surface. If you have a membrane that uh, bends and makes something that looks like a kink, this contact angle is not sufficient to characterize this system because as you see here, the same system, the same membrane composition, the same droplets exhibit different contact angles. I'll skip this slide. Uh, where I wanted to tell you that there is a way to go around and introduce a geometric factor that can describe this and it's a material property contrary to the contact angles that one can optically uh, measure. And uh, go to tell you that um, in, when you have uh, wetting, when the, when the droplets want to wet the membrane, uh, when there are such conditions, we can observe that vesicles can bridge condensates or condensates can bridge or like connect vesicles or you can think of a, a role of condensates um, as a con connectivity mean between membrane bound organelles in the, in the cell. If you have these uh, droplets, you know that in the cell very often conditions change locally. So if you just have an upshift or down, downshift in salt or pH, you can induce phase separation inside these droplets, ending up with something called hollow condensates. They still have aqueous solution inside, but the shape is of a hollow structure. They have the same affinity to the membrane as the normal condensates, but uh, it looks as if hollow condensates could provide additional means for uh, compartmentation in cells where you can think of one reaction, the cell focusing one reaction in one uh, compartment or the, the, the protein rich droplet or the, or the membrane organelle. What condensates do to the membrane when they wet them is that they uh, slow down the, the diffusion in the, in the lipids. So here we have uh, fluorescence recovery after photobleaching uh, experiments done on a vesicle that on one side has a droplet wetting it. So in the weighted part, we see that the diffusion is twice slower compared to the bare part of the membrane. Using environmentally sensitive probes such as uh, Laudan, we also resolve that the packing in this uh, weighted region in the membrane is increased and the lipid gets uh, dehydrated. Uh, at the same time, we also uh, see that both the, 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 the vesicles and the condensate mutually mold each other. Um, if you start with such a system and you deflate the membrane, you see that the, it starts accumulating at the interface and then it um, uh, forms protrusions or ruffles. Um, they are even more spectacular if um, you have more excess area and uh, this is an interesting um, uh, picture here showing that the flat part of the uh, membrane, so this is basically flat on molecular level, coexists with a very wiggled uh, um, surface or protrusions on the other side of the vesicle. If you apply some tension on the bare part of the membrane, you can pull these wiggles out and they would reform if you, um, um, the, the ruffles would reform if you uh, release the tension. So uh, increasing the playing with the area can be done not only with uh, uh, deflating such vesicles, but one could also use uh, photoswitchable molecules that can um, influence the area and the tension of the membrane. And this is one such molecule, a lipid that can undergoes conformational change with UV and blue light, which is reversible. And this was uh, work uh, initiated by Mina Alexanian in the group. So when you shine light to, to such vesicles, they increase in uh, area and then you can shine blue light and this reverses. this. And this is one movie here showing a, a very special vesicle that when you shine the UV light, 
it undergoes this uh, transformation, which is completely reversible when you shine the uh, blue light. So why am I telling you about these membranes? Coming back to the droplets, we we're wondering if we have this regulator for membrane area, whether we can influence to what extent the membrane wraps the membrane, uh, the membrane wraps the condensate. And it turned out that this is feasible. So you start with a membrane sticking to a condensate, but then when you shine the UV light and increase the area of the of the uh, of the vesicle, it tries to wrap more or eat eat more of the condensate. And this is a movie showing this. This is reversible with blue light. And if you have um, smaller droplet and a larger vesicle, you can even go to the extent of complete engulfment or something like you can think of endocytosis, but this is reversible. So you shine blue light and the droplet goes out. Um, and the final thing I wanted to tell you about is that, um, so condensates can do much more than wet bridge and deformed membranes. They can also stabilize vesicles upon uh, damage. And this was work uh, in collaboration with the Gutierrez lab in the Crick uh, Institute in, um, in the UK, um, where we did the, the following. So now we encapsulated our protein uh, in a homogeneous uh, state. So we are coming back to the phase diagram here. We start somewhere here, where you have some homogeneous solution of the protein, no phase separation. And uh, this is our vesicle. And outside, we exchange the solution such that we uh, that if the protein leaves the membrane, it would end up in this region where condensate should form. At the same time, we create a pore by using a hypotonic shock. And when the protein leaves the membrane, it forms the condensate, which localizes at the pore. The way we do that is um, by, oops, uh, uh, Rumi, just, just to let you know, you have about maybe four or five minutes. Yes, I have two more slides. That's great. Perfect, perfect. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the way we, we do that is we have these microfluidic chips where we trap our vesicles. So these are PDMS um, um, posts. And then we flush the solution that we are interested in. And then we look at certain vesicles. So here is a, a movie. These are the microfluidic posts and our vesicle, which initially had this glycine solution, homogeneous. But then when it uh, porates, the condensate forms. Everything is very dynamic because we have a flow and the whole thing uh, turns around. But if we stop the flow and do some imaging, we see the formation of the pore. The protein leaks out. And the moment it meets the solution outside, which uh, um, primes it for condensation, the, the condensate forms and at the end plucks this or um, uh, patches this uh, pore. And then you have this moon-like shape, uh, struck, uh, like uh, looking vesicles with the craters on them plugged by the, uh, the condensate. Um, without the condensate, such vesicles, so these are just two component membranes with uh, some charged lipids. If you porate them, they will typically burst. And here's uh, some movies that I like showing of uh, porating and bursting vesicles, but they're irrelevant now for this presentation. I just like this movie. That's why I'm showing them. Uh, a more relevant system that we looked in, again, in a similar way, is um, uh, trying, um, is an, uh, was an attempt to kind of reconstitute stress granules uh, and look at their um, um, uh, membrane damage stabilization. And the motivation was that the Gutierrez lab has um, observed uh, some colocalization of stress granules with lysosomes that are damaged. Um, so these stress granules, um, are, one can reconstitute them in vitro by using this uh, protein, G3BP, and RNA. Uh, this is collaboration with the Franzman lab. So what we try to do with our giant vesicles is to build an inside out lysosome. So typically in lysosomes, the pH is low. In our case, the pH was, uh, uh, we reduced the pH by outside. That's why we call it inside out. Inside we encapsulate G3BP1 and outside we added the RNA. When these two molecules meet in the right pH, they would form a condensate. And at the same time, we porated the membrane and look whether condensates would form and stabilize the membranes. And this is indeed what happened. This movie is a little bit more complex, but over time one sees that after operation, the condensate forms. And then if you do some imaging of that, you will see the pore in the membrane that is plucked by the condensate. 
So I come to my conclusions. Membranes don't need much. A little asymmetry or droplet wetting is enough to trigger tube sprouting, budding, engulfment, and even uh, uh, repair and fission. I did not talk about fission, but then isn't it obvious that the shaping of organelles such as the endoplasmic reticulum or Golgi or the mitochondria can be driven not only by protein uh, functionality, but uh, simply also helped by physical chemical um, factors such as spontaneous curvature generation, weighting and phase uh, separation. And uh, these are the people that I already mentioned in the talk. I'll just uh, say that uh, we are setting up a network, come and sell on condensate membrane scaffold. So we'll have 17 open uh, positions for PhD students can contact me about that. And um, I'll stop here. And uh, thank you for your attention. I'll be looking forward to your questions.